This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, historian John Strasbaugh on the harrowing history of the Soviet space program. Early one morning, these three half-starved, small Soviet men in uh, basically leisure suits, looking like they were going on a cruise ship rather than a spaceship, got into this thing, got fired off, and survived. They actually orbited and came back down alive. And, and, And that says almost everything about the Soviet space program in those early years. They were just brilliant at snatching victory out of the jaws of defeat. There were a million reasons why that rocket should have failed, that Sputnik itself shouldn't have worked, but the rocket didn't fail and Sputnik did in fact work. And uh, it was great news everywhere around the world, except in, in the United States. John Strasbaugh, welcome to Chatter. It is great to have you on our show. It's great to be here. Thanks very much, Shane. I am holding here your your new book, which comes out today uh, when the podcast is airing. Um, the title alone was enough to make me just stop and say, okay, yeah, I want to read this. <laughs> uh, the Wrong Stuff, How the Soviet Space Program Crashed and Burned. Um, if you need it more than that, there's a fantastic picture of a, a Soviet-era rocket going down towards the Earth, rather up in the sky, which is um, uh, uh, portends to the theme of this book, obviously playing on the, the fame title of The Right Stuff about mm-hmm. the U.S. Mercury astronaut program, the famous is Mercury 7. Um, I love this book. This is a harrowing and hilarious account of a history that I will admit as a space geek um, knew absolutely nothing about. I had long assumed that the space race of the 1950s and 60s was pitting two kind of great superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, um, who were, if not necessarily always technologically matched, probably sort of matched in engineering prowess and, you know, like basic concern for the safety of the human beings they were sticking on top of these rockets. Nope. <laughs> turns out, turns out not. Um, this is, it's a really fantastic uh, history that is going to surprise a lot of people. Um, I wanted to start by asking you how you got onto this story. I mean, you, you've written histories before. You're an author. You've written for a lot of publications. You've done a number of books. What interested you in this kind of hidden story about the truth of the Soviet space program? And what made you think that there was a book in it? Um, I, 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 too, am a space geek. And, and I grew up in the space race. I love the space race. I've always been really interested in it. But over time, it, it was hard not to notice that we were only getting the NASA side of the story which is fine. It, the NASA story is a great story, but we weren't hearing much of the Soviet side of it, which seemed to me an awful imbalance. Um, the reason is, is that uh, they were great at hiding it and lying about it. All, all governments hide facts from us. All governments lie to us, but they were maniacal about it and really, really good at it. Um, you know, they may not have been so great at putting people up into orbit, but they were great at lying about it and, and propagandizing us about it. Um, so in the 90s, after the Soviet Union fell, then material that had never been seen before in the West began to leak out. And then it flooded out and there was tons and tons of data and uh, personal memoirs and uh, diaries that they'd hidden for 30 years that they could finally put out in public about the space race from insiders, the engineers, the the cosmonauts, um, the bureaucrats. And I just thought over time, I was like, oh, that's enough to start working on on a book about the the wrong stuff. We know the right stuff. Now let's get a book done about the wrong stuff. You know, I, I God knows I didn't need to write another book about NASA. But uh, a book about the the Soviet space program, I thought now's the time. So, so there it was. And when these documents were coming out, and I mean, you you write in the book about you know documents and memorabilia from the Soviet space program being sold off at auction. I mean, yeah. I, I imagine like some of this stuff probably fell into the hands of governments. But how did it kind of make its way from the the secret confines of the Kremlin or the Soviet program into the public? Once, when the wall came down and the Soviet Union fell, 
there was nothing and nobody there to stop people from ransacking the files. It wasn't just about the space program. They People just, there were tens and ten, probably millions of pages of previously hidden files and data that flooded out of the former Soviet Union. Um, one thing to remember is that the Russian Federation, as it called itself after the Soviet Union fell, was desperately poor. And so people were selling it anywhere, all sorts of memorabilia. They would steal a general's field tunic and sell it on eBay. They were, uh, eBay in fact became flooded with Soviet memorabilia there for mm. a while. Um, Sotheby's is where people took the, the documents that hadn't been seen before. And of course here, there were all sorts of people in the West who were only too happy to pay money to collect that stuff and begin looking at what had been going on that we didn't know about. So it, it's a funny thing that that's what it, the, there's a, a character in the book named Ivan Ivanova. And Ivan was a, a dummy that they used. It was like a crash test dummy that they used in some of their flights. Uh, he got auctioned off at Sotheby's at one point in the 90s. <laughs> that would have been very cool. I read that and I thought, I actually wouldn't mind owning the, the <laughs> crash test dummy. Me too. Put him in a chair, prop him up. Yeah, that that was great. Um, I w- let's start. The, your book traverses a, a a really. It's not a huge amount of history. But it's the, it's the meat of the real space race from like the launch of Sputnik up, and you have some great stuff about the Soviets or the Russians' uh, uh, experience with Mir and the uh, their their imitation of the space shuttle. But let's start kind of at the beginning, that everyone knows with Sputnik, which is the first satellite that any humans put into orbit. Um, I think that that launch. I mean, it looms very big in the popular imagination is kind of this seminal moment that it's it's terrifying to the Americans. It's the fear of Russian technology to start up mm-hmm. space, right? It comes across in your telling as a little bit less dramatic um, yeah. and kind of this like proto illustration of the harried slapdash approach that the Soviets took to space flight. So tell us the Sputnik story through the lens of the wrong stuff. Like almost everything in the Soviet space program, Sputnik was an answer to a a political desire much more than a scientific or engineering one. The guys who did it, the guys running the space program, were good scientists and good engineers, and you can't take anything away from them on that level. But they were being harried and hurried and pushed around by the political leaders, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, obviously, but other political leaders. So they were always trying to meet um, a, a political agenda, a propaganda agenda. Um, Khrushchev was desperate to show the world that the Soviet Union had um, the rocketry for ICBMs, for in- international ballistic missiles that they could threaten the United States with because he was convinced that the Americans had a, a great force of them. There was a point where he had like four of these that they could have shot off as opposed to hundreds that we have. We could have obliterated them many times over. So he he did a lot of blustering and a lot of bragging and a lot of lying about their capacity. And as a piece of that, through the years, starting with Sputnik and then going on through the manned space program, were these space program shots, um, you know, proving to the world that we can put the first sat- man-made satellite in orbit Um, was a great coup for them, a great propaganda coup. And in a way, the big lie. It was because they just barely got it up there. It was the size of a beach ball with a big battery inside because they didn't know how to do transistor batteries yet, like the Japanese and and later the Americans did. Um, It could go beep, beep, beep as it went by. And that that was it. That was what Sputnik was and what it could do. Yet they got it up there, and it's amazing that they got it up there. And a big piece of the story of the Soviet space program in the early years is how they were just brilliant at snatching victory out of the jaws of defeat over and over and over again. There were a million reasons why that that rocket should have failed, that uh, that Sputnik itself shouldn't have worked. But the rocket didn't fail and Sputnik did, in fact, work. And uh, it was great news everywhere around the world, except in in the United States. The United States very consciously played it down. Eisenhower said, oh, it's just a metal ball in the sky. Who cares? Uh, 
Americans at first were not particularly interested in it. Um, by 1957, when it happened in America, if you were threatened, it was because, you know, space creatures were coming in flying saucers and, and shooting laser guns at you. A, a, a beach ball floating around over your head, you were like, yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. They only became agitated, American public became agitated about it as American politicians and the American press told them they should be worried about it and should be terrified about it. And they had their own agendas. Obviously, the press never tells you things are good. The press always tells you the, the sky is falling. <laughs> so the sky was falling. Um, and the politicians at the time, particularly John Kennedy, who was a young senator and planning a run to be president of the United States, where uh, it served their purposes to, uh, in effect, partner with Khrushchev in his propaganda and say, oh, my Lord, they have put this thing up there. We've got to get going. We've got to rush or they're going to destroy us. And Khrushchev is just, you know, he's he's thrilled about Sputnik, but he becomes just, I mean, maniacal about doing more firsts, being the first to put a human yeah. being up, being the first later to put a woman up. I mean, it, it is almost the, part of the great narrative kind of thrust of your book is Khrushchev on this an insatiable quest to keep ratcheting up first, totally with disregard for the safety of the people who he's putting <laughs> on these rockets. And I think that it's it, that was such an, um, a revelation to me in the book, because I think of him as you know, kind of being on par with our national leaders, considered right. strategic, whatever. And he is just throwing things at the wall and pushing everybody to go a thousand miles an hour. We, we have to remember that um, the world after World War II seemed to have two great superpowers. There was the undeniable one, which was the United States of America. And then there was the pretend one, which was the Soviet Union, which behind its Iron Curtain was much more devastated at the end of World War II. Um, you know, they lost 27 million people in, in World War II. We lost a couple hundred thousand, uh, well, 400,000, but still, there, it was a complete disparity. We came out of it the richest nation on earth. We came out of it the only nuclear or atomic power on earth. Uh, we came out of it with all the materials to, uh, to begin a real space program and, and build our own rockets. They did not. Um, he got by for for his entire time as the leader of the Soviet Union on bluff and bluster and bragging and, and being a brilliant uh, propagandist and and pretending. So he had to ha keep having these isolated victories, uh, the first rocket to do this, the first satellite, the first man in space, the first woman in space, as a way to keep convincing the world that he was, in fact, on par with the Americans when the whole time behind the scenes they were racing to try to catch up with the Americans. Um, some Americans knew that, uh, uh, you know, Americans in power with the, with the secrets. Richard Nixon knew it. He knew very well that they didn't have anywhere near parity with us. But it suited American politicians to play along with it so they could build up, you know, their own space program. So for Khrushchev, it's a, it's a desperate uh, high wire act. And if people are thrown up there in, in capsules that they shouldn't have been in without safety equipment, without any emergency exits, with nothing to go for, wearing what in fact were leisure suits as opposed to space suits because they couldn't fit in these little capsules in their space suits, he didn't care. His, his, uh, his motto was, you know, make it so. Yeah. There's a yeah. great anecdote that you open the book with that is illustrative of, of Khrushchev's uh, um, insistence that they keep ratcheting up records, which is where yeah. they decide to put, uh, make sure I've got the, the math wrong, three people into a capsule built for one. Tell, tell that story and, and the uh, kind of the excruciating things that these cosmonauts had to do just to get ready for the flight. I, I love that story. I start the book with it because it is, in many ways, it's not the only illustrative one, but it is very illustrative. It's 1964. By now, um, the Mercury program is up and running. The, there have been three or four cosmonauts um, who have orbited. So they're, both sides are looking for what's the next step. And the Americans announced the Gemini program, where they're going to put two astronauts in a capsule and fly that. Khrushchev calls um, the man Sergei Korolyov, who was the head 
of, of the space program, the, the genius of the space program. Um, he calls him in and he says, the Americans are going to put two astronauts up. I want us to, to put three cosmonauts up and do that before the Americans. So the, you know, for the obvious propaganda value. Korolev says, can't be done. I mean, we can do it in a couple of years, but we don't have the rocket. Uh, we don't have the space capsule. Uh, so we got to work on all that. And Khrushchev said, no, no, no. I want it like in a few months. Um, so uh, Korolev had already survived Stalin, years of, of Stalin. So he wasn't going to argue. Um, went back to his guys and said, all right, we got to put three people up and, and what we had, which was the space capsule that was the original uh, Soviet space capsule. It looked like a BB pellet. It was just a big ball and not all that big. You couldn't be over five, six to fit in it. You had to be relatively small and lightweight. Astronauts did too. You know, they wanted to minimize how much they had to throw up into space. But um, this was a tiny little thing for one guy, and they and they were going to squeeze now three guys into it. And all his engineers said, impossible, we can't do it. And he said, do you want to tell that to Nikita? And they said, all right, we'll do it. And, uh, <laughs> and they didn't want to go to Siberia. Um, right. So uh, they tore everything out of it, basically. They emptied it all out. Um, the original seat that the astronaut, that the first cosmonaut sat in, um, a lot of the equipment, which wasn't... A, it was not, in fact, a ton because they didn't have a lot of equipment in those days to put in these vehicles. But still, they tore it all out. They figured out how to squeeze three kind of lounge chairs into it. Um, but then they still couldn't figure out how to get three cosmonauts in there, even at five foot six and, and relatively lightweight um, in a space built for one guy. So um, one of them, one of the engineers said, well, we might be able to squeeze three guys in if they don't wear spacesuits. And Korolyov, the head of the program, says, well, who'd be suicidal enough to go up in one of these things without a spacesuit? And the guy said, oh, I will. <laughs> he had survived the Nazis. Yeah, the, one of the things about the, the wrong stuff, as I call it, is that, you know, we think of the astronauts as these space cowboys, these brave, you know, it's the whole right stuff thing. They had the right stuff. Part of having the right stuff is that you could be pretty sure that if you had the guts to sit in that capsule and get fired off by that rocket, it wasn't going to let you down because it was American technology. It was the best technology in the world at the time. If you were a cosmonaut, you had no such assurances. They were slapping these things together out of bits and pieces that they had at times lying around, literally stuff lying around that they turned into space capsules. So it took a specific, I think, uh, and very different kind of courage to say, yes, I'll get in there. And I think it probably took a lot of vodka, too. They drank a lot of vodka. Yes. Um, but they had survived World War II, which was extraordinarily hideous in the Soviet Union. They had survived Stalin, who was a madman, who was massacring his own people every chance he got. So the, a certain, you know, devil-may-care attitude about going up in a space. They were like, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And then they got two other guys to do it. And they tried to figure out how to squeeze them and still couldn't squeeze them into the space. So they said, all right, we're going to have to get rid of all the emergency equipment. So it was an <laughs> That's <laughs> it was so <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> um, so, and they said, okay, fine. And then they still couldn't get them in there. So they said, all right, you all have to go on a diet. So they put them all on a diet. So finally, early one morning, these three half-starved, uh, small Soviet men in uh, basically leisure suits, looking like they were going on a cruise ship rather than a spaceship, got into this thing, got fired off, and survived. They actually orbited and came back down alive. And, and, and that says almost everything about the Soviet space program in those early years. They Somehow they were pulling it off. You know, not always. A lot of times they weren't, and, and they hid the fact that they weren't. But when they did, you got to give them credit for, as I would say, having the wrong stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's worth mentioning, too, and this comes across in the book. And I suppose you could say to some degree this about the American program as well. I mean, there is a kind of patriotic heroism that it's attached to it. But, like, you know, this is, I mean, 
once you're, they're basically just firing people into this, into space and bringing them back down again. This is not necessarily, a, I mean, it's a technological feat, but we're not necessarily advancing science beyond the science of rocketry and whatever. There's an almost kind of just, you know, death defying stunt aspect to it, which a lot of people make criticisms about the space program. Well, you know, like, in fact, I, you know, Sputnik and, and, and satellites had a lot more applications. Yes, that's right. And, and, and the military people knew that all along. They were always pushing for more satellites, fewer of these grandstanding, putting a guy in orbit. Who cares that a guy was in orbit? He didn't do us any good up there. But the satellites for communication down here, for uh, strategic planning and other, you know, they were really... They did count for some. But you mentioned they knew how to put them up there and bring them back down. In fact, the Soviets were not at all sure that they could bring people well, back yes. either. Um, you know, astronauts had the great leisure of being able to land on soft, you know, uh, temperate waters of the Atlantic. Uh, these guys, because the Soviets were so maniacal about secrecy and hiding everything, they put their version of Cape Canaveral, their, their Baikonur Cosmodrome, out in the middle of absolutely nothing in in Kazakhstan, out in the desert. And so those capsules, which, as I say, were kind of BB balls, they were more like space ordnance than space capsules. Um, They came down hard on hard ground. So in the early years, they they could not figure out how to have them not do that. So they built in ejection seats. And uh, so for, uh, Yuri Gagarin, for instance, um, first man in space, as he's coming back down, there's a zillion problems as he's coming back down because they hadn't figured that part out yet. He almost dies the whole time he's coming back down. Finally, uh, it, the, the, ca- the, um, the hatch over his head bursts open. The ejection seat he's sitting on bursts him out of the capsule and his parachute luckily opens and he parachutes to the ground. But that's how they landed for a while. And they hid that fact from the world forever uh, into, into the, I think, the 1980s, maybe even the 90s. Um, they didn't want that known, that they didn't know how to bring these capsules back down. So, yeah, it's one of the most it's one of the most shocking parts I thought of the story. It was exactly as you said. They didn't know if this was going to work. They weren't sure about the science. Um, you, you write about these harrowing reentries, and I mean, and, and and to be for people who don't know the kind of the atmospheric science, as it were, on reentry, there's a, a real risk of the craft incinerating yeah. in the atmosphere and the person just burning to death, and it's horrific. Yeah. But there's this there's this glitch that they notice. Um, on some of the, the on these first three entries, where there is essentially there's a module that they think is supposed to detach from the capsule in which this cosmonaut is sitting, and it doesn't. It's kind of like tied on with boot laces, as you write to this thing. Talk about that and what that does to the capsule, and importantly, the fact that they never correct it. <laughs> It's, it's it's one of the more amazing and appalling things to me that they never bothered to figure that out. The the um, so there was the ball, the the big giant BB, and then behind it was a a pack of the rockets and the equipment and the oxygen tanks and stuff like that. As it comes down, as it comes plummeting down into the atmosphere, those are supposed to detach. So it's just the ball, and the ball is actually weighted so that the bottom faces down as it's descending, and the bottom is where the heat shield is. Now, they never quite figured out the heat shields either. but, but <laughs> Minor the- point. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, the heat shield is going to you know, protect the, the cosmonaut. But in fact, for the first several years of the program, the, those two pieces never did disconnect as they were supposed to. And so you had, it was like a pair of boots with their laces tied together, flopping around, coming down at at ballistic speeds. So the cosmonauts being tossed back and forth, even if they're, if if all their harnesses and stuff are really good, their blood vessels are bursting in their eyeballs. They're, they're experiencing G forces that are as though a car is sitting on their chest. They're blacking out. Um, They're just barely surviving. And what the way that they survive is that, uh, the cables holding those two things together burn through from the immense heat of reentry, and the other thing finally just falls off. And you, if you're lucky, it does that in enough time for you to, for your your ball to right itself, 
and land correctly, um, and for you be well to parachute out of it just in case, so um, so you can survive it. And that goes on for years. They don't fix it. They don't fix it. They don't fix. It. There were other things. There was a glitch in uh, in the capsule where one of the antennas, because they all had they were festooned with the ten- antennas, would catch the parachute as it was opening and rip it, and. The, the the engineer who saw that happening was supposed to report it, but we're talking the Soviet Union, and and quite often it, you shot the messenger. So uh, if he reported it, it was his fault. He was going to lose his job, maybe lose his head. Um, so or certainly be at the very least be sent to Siberia. So he doesn't say anything, and they don't fix it for quite a while, um, and and that's typical of the program. The big piece of the problem is that you're trying to do high science in the Soviet Union. And, and the Soviet Union was a disaster and a dysfunctional place on many levels. And that's one of the levels that the kind of um, uh, repressive bureaucracy that existed, where if you discovered a problem, you didn't say anything because you didn't want to be the one who had discovered the problem. Yeah. It seems like the, the the incident with the instrument pack failing to come off and you know burning just finally burning itself off certainly yeah. something the cosmonauts would would notice right they would I mean it may not if they ever diagnosed it but why I mean did the cosmonauts ever speak up and say like hey guys like this this thing keeps happening fix this yeah, you know I think part of it is that they had they definitely had they were jet pilots they were all fighter pilots. Uh, so they definitely had the fighter jock attitude. Um, shut up. You just go up there. Um, the second one who flew, uh, Tito, um, reported in detail the problems he was having during his flight. He thought he was doing this the program a favor by reporting all this stuff. But the military men involved, there was always a military, more of a military program than a civilian program, as was NASA. But NASA was better at pretending to be a, a civilian program. Um, the, the military guys to whom he uh, reported this thought, hmm, he's kind of a sissy. He mm-hmm. listen to him complain. And he never, in fact, got to fly in space again. They kind of, they didn't demote him. They couldn't because he was a hero of the Soviet Union. But uh, he, he got dissed for speaking up. So you didn't speak up. That was one of the reasons. I really think another reason is that if you survive and you manage to get back down to ground, your life was wonderful from that day forward. They were the first Soviet rock stars. They were the first Soviet movie stars. They lived, especially Gagarin and Titov, the first two. They were like living it up like, like Led Zeppelin on tour for years after that. And there was nothing their superiors could do about it because they were the heroes of the Soviet Union. So I know all these guys were thinking about that as they were you know, tumbling down at horrific, terrifying speeds in machines that were failing them and falling apart around them as they came down. There was one guy who came down face first. The, the capsule didn't flip around the way it should. And uh, he was watching it melt around him uh, luckily, it finally did flip around in the right direction right near the end. But he was like, all right, I'm a dead man. Uh, okay. Right, right. And I think to your point about, you know, that they that these are a generation that had um, survived against incredible odds in many cases, the, you know, yeah. the, the Second World War and the Nazis, they must have had a kind of sense of, well, if I made it back down to earth, there has to be a sense of invincibility. And, and you know, and Gagarin, Yuri Gagarin, who, you know, many Americans know because he was the first yeah. human in space. I mean, it seems like fame turned him into a monster. I mean, he just becomes this hard drinking, womanizing guy who has a real attitude and can get away with saying things that normal, you know, good party members and Soviets would not be allowed to say. Um, say a little bit about Gagarin and, and teed off to this interesting dynamic and what kind of this fame does to them as, as quote unquote, ordinary Russians. Well, we have to, there, there were no famous people in Russia except a couple of generals who did really well during the war were well known, um, including one who was involved with the space program. But, uh, and, you know, Stalin and Lenin, and, and otherwise there weren't famous, you, nobody was famous. That was the, the point of being a Soviet citizen was that you were, you know, one of the Soviet citizens. Um, so uh, Gagarin 
I, I, it just blew his mind that all of a sudden he could have a sports car. This is a guy who grew up on a collective farm. You know, if he had a potato for breakfast, he was just overjoyed. Um, if they got an extra glass of vodka, they were just ecstatic. And suddenly he's got women falling all over him around the world. They put him on a world tour everywhere he goes. Women are falling on him. People are getting him drunk all the time. People are giving him sports cars. Uh, he's on the cover of magazines. Nothing. No Soviet citizen, normal Soviet citizen, had experienced anything like this. And Titov came along a few months behind him. So the two of them were the bad boys um, of the Soviet space program. And, of course, could get away with it because they had been touted around the world by Khrushchev's propaganda machine, as these great heroes, these superhumans, practically. Um, so they, they could be privately drubbed down and, and, and were constantly being brought in before their superior officers, but nothing could happen to them in public. Um, so they got away with terrible stuff, terrible stuff. The, the, um, the story I like about Gagarin is that at a certain point, um, after he becomes fa after he comes back and he becomes famous, his face in, in all the photos starts to look kind of lopsided. And it's like he, he's only got like half an eyebrow over his uh, left eye. It, it's because he got so drunk at a party and he was chasing a pretty girl around and his wife was going to catch him. So he jumped off a balcony, hit his head on a rock, dented his head. <laughs> The other cosmonaut said, you know, you hurt yourself more falling six feet than you did falling from outer space. It's amazing. But you can understand it. And they were young guys. They were like in their 20s. They weren't. The American astronauts tended to be older. They were in their 30s. They were married. They were stable. They were you know, white. They were uh, Christian. Um, they were, they were, you know, the man in the gray flannel space suit. These, the real space cowboys were these younger, wilder cosmonauts. Yeah, and, and, and it really, it, it, the taste they get for adventure, it must have been kind of intoxicating. Um, and, and one of the things that they had to go through, the cosmonauts and their training, that uh, the, the American astronauts would not, um, is essentially survival training, or at least having to know how to survive in the wilderness. Because when these space capsules would come down, as you've said, on land, or when they would parachute out of them before they landed on land, um, they did not always land on target, which meant that sometimes, <laughs> many times, the cosmonauts were literally lost in the woods, waiting yeah. for people to come find them. Talk, talk about that. It, it's just another thing that I just found utterly extraordinary. It was like, you've made it back to Earth. Hopefully you won't be eaten by a bear or, or freeze to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a piece of, because, you know, okay. So NASA proceeded one step at a time and figured everything out. NASA would never put a guy in a capsule that they hadn't checked over a million times and knew exactly how it was going to fly, where it was going to land. Those landings, there's a reason that the the aircraft carrier was always kind of right on hand because they knew where they were going to land those things. Soviets had did not have that engineering. They did not have that technology. They could put it up there. They hoped it came down within a couple hundred kilometers of where they thought it was going to come down, but quite often it did not. And they would land, um, guys landed in the middle of Siberian forests in winter with, where the snow was up to their chins. And there were wolves circling them and, and hungry bears there. And it took, it would take the helicopters quite a while to figure out where they were. They're out looking for them, of course, but they don't know where they are. Some guys spent a couple of nights, three nights out in the woods waiting to be picked up and saved. Um, it, it got to a point where one of the cosmonauts, who did speak up actually about this, um, and, and said, you know, we've got to be able to protect ourselves. And they came up with a special cosmonaut uh, sawed-off shotgun that they could carry with them for the bears. Or for if they landed in China or somewhere hostile, they wanted to be able to protect themselves. But it, the discussion was, well, if we put it in the capsule, um, what if they go space crazy in the capsule and, and shoot each other up? So it was outside the capsule. So the capsule, they had to you know, land and then go outside the capsule and find the shotgun. I read that detail and I thought to myself, it, it would be just, I, I could imagine them thinking like, yeah, this reentry is pretty bad. We don't want them to shoot themselves in the, in the head if they think this is about to die anyway. Um, it's, by the time that they got around to having space stations, um, like Salyut, uh, 
life in there was so awful that they really were going space crazy. There was a couple examples of guys going going nuts up there um, from being in this horrible, horrible little space capsule, a uh, space station uh, in orbit for days and days and days on end. Yeah. So yeah, there was a real reason you didn't want them to be armed. <laughs> yeah, and, and the 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 the, port, the picture you paint of of uh, life inside these cramped spaces, and even on these sort of early, uh, uh, you know, space stations, it, it, you know, they were it smells like a locker room, and it's damp, yeah. and they're on top of one another. It's really, it's really kind of revolting. They didn't have much better conditions on Earth. You know, NASA had Cape Canaveral, where of course yeah. now you know, where they launched. Uh, the missions from the Russians had their their cosmodrome and ultimately a couple of them. And the first one, I mean, it sounds like an absolute hellscape um, yeah. and, and it doesn't get much better over the years. But talk oh. about where they stuck these people and the conditions they were living in on the ground. Because they wanted it to be secret uh, so that they could, you know, they could um, publicize their triumphs all around the world. But any mistakes they made, they hoped would be hidden. They weren't thinking that the Americans were flying the U-2 over them and then later satellites and could see every mistake they made anyway. But they thought if it's out there. So um, it's in the middle of, of the Kizilkum Desert in uh, Kazakhstan, which is just horrendous. It's blistering hot and filled with scorpions and fleas and rats in the summer. Then um, it's... Uh, terribly frigid with like snow tornadoes blowing at you in the winter. It's somewhere no one would want to be. Uh, and no one did. They, you know, this is the Soviet Union. All labor was in effect forced labor. So you were told you were going to go there. So they went. Um, the soldiers who built it were, were dying there because it was so horrible. Um, no one wanted to serve there. It was, it was one of their secret facilities. So you couldn't tell anybody you were there on top of everything else. Um, and nobody was supposed to know you were there anyway. So um, it never got better. It was always a nightmare, except for, you know, the bosses had nice little cabins that they were in. But everyone else, uh, this sort of dreary Soviet drab little city grew up around it over the years, over the decades. Um, but it's never been a place you'd want to be. And it's apparently it's still not to this day. Yeah, and, it, and it's such a good illustration too. And you, and you about the, the 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 one of the main differences between the way NASA and the Soviets ran the program is NASA was completely transparent, right? People went to go see the launches. They it was an event to go see yeah. these things. Whereas launching from the Cosmodrome, when you know nobody sees it unless they publicize it, and so yeah. many times in these early days, these rockets were exploding. Uh, you know, blowing up in the launch pad. You read about one event that I, I had never actually heard of, which killed an astonishing number of people on the ground. Uh, the, the, it was called an R-16. Um, and it was a more military, it was, in fact, it was a military uh, rocket. It was not civilian. Um, the guy running it, this man named General Needlin, was one of those stiff, he was a hero of the war, um, had more medals on his chest than than anyone um, and he had this habit of insisted on kind of being right there, uh, like in a lawn chair when the rocket took off. Everybody else was in a bunker. They were, they were being smart about it. But because he wanted to be there, then his entourage had to be there, all the lesser officers and, and uh, military students. And so, so he had this huge entourage around this, this rocket that they were rushing. Typically, they were rushing to get this rocket off the ground because they wanted to meet one of their um, their dates. I think it was May 1st. They wanted to have it done by May 1st. Or maybe it was Lenin's birthday in April. Was, they always were rushing them to meet those kind of dates. Um, he rushed everybody. He rushed all the engineers. They were terrified of this thing. Um, but they went ahead and lit the fuse, and it blew up on the pad. Um, there's horrific black and white automatically. There was automatic footage being taken from cameras at it not much distance um just horrific footage of guys like lighting up like matches as they're falling from from the gantries guys running away on fire a hundred they they don't know to this day but it, it's probably 165 people died in this and including the general all they found of him was like the keys his keys that were kind of melted and part of one of his shoulder straps they found nothing else of the gun 
Um, they were all obliterated by this thing. Just horrible. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it's just, it's, you can't, I mean, well, you, you can't imagine NASA doing something like this because they, they didn't, it seems to me, they, well, they valued human life perhaps more. But I mean, you would think that there would be some, at every moment that, that, when they had these disasters, there would be some course correction. And they're just, there never really is. They just kind of keep going. Later on, they finally begin, they would pause. There was a, a just, a, it, especially if it was one that they couldn't hide. They hid this one. Nobody knew about this one yeah. for at the time. Um, there was another one uh, later, a few couple, like 1967. So several years later at that point, um, where they had made such a big deal about this guy's flight because he was flying in... Um, the, the first Soyuz um, spacecraft, which is a giant step forward from the old ones, the BBs, the giant BBs. But it still had a zillion problems that they hadn't fixed by the time they put the guy up. And he died horribly coming back down and smashing into the ground. They couldn't hide that one. They had to admit that one uh, because they had all the press there and they were, you know, they were touting him. Um, and it was the first one they actually, I think, it, I'm pretty sure it's the first one they admitted in public because they could not hide it. They couldn't lie about that one. Um, and that really caused them to stop and pause and, and think things through for a while. But that was the first one after a long line of just, they had this, uh, their attitude was kind of, well, that didn't work. Let's try another one. And they would throw something else up. Right, right. And we should say you mentioned kind of lighting the fuse uh, of the rocket figuratively. There was an element of it where it was almost literally lighting the fuse. Can you talk just a little bit about how this in these early rockets, they would have to ignite them because they had to get the engines all firing at the same time? That's the point. You have all these nozzles um, from the engines. They all have to fire at the same time and at the same rate of fire. Or if one, or, if one of them isn't firing, the whole thing's going to go literally sideways. So um, the Americans, being the Americans, came up with this very technological lighting all the fuses at once um, program that they had a long technological name for. The Russians basically had um, a long, it was like a long kitchen match. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, like a broom length kitchen match and literally guys would climb climb under the thing like that each one was they were supposed to all light it at the same time and then run like hell in case that you know the thing blew up on them which it often did it's just i mean just, it's it's one of so many stories in your book you just you can't believe that they were doing this and succeeding some of the times that's the thing it worked it worked often enough that they kept doing it for years so yeah. Yeah. i mean that's part of what i call the wrong stuff too that ability to do things in such a slapdash piece together manner and yet you know succeed often enough yeah yeah and it did. I want to talk to you about the um, uh, what we call the first the first spacewalk, or the technical term yeah. would be extravehicular yeah. activity. So this is when an astronaut or a cosmonaut puts on a spacesuit, gets outside of the craft they're flying in, and, and moves around in space. And Alexei Leonov was the the first yeah. person to do this. He was a cosmonaut. Um, I I knew that just as a point of you know historical fact. Um, I did not know anything about what this <laughs> adventure was like. Yeah. Um, talk just about first uh, the the contraption, I guess we would have to call it yeah. that, that the yeah. Soviets developed to get Leonov from inside the safety of his capsule to the vacuum of space. Yes. Once again, they heard that NASA was planning a flight with a Gemini flight. So there would be two ast astronauts on board. One would, in effect, open the door and just kind of stick his head and shoulders up. In his, but that would be the first person in space to at least partly leave the capsule. So the Soviets being the Soviets said, oh, no, you don't. We're going to put a guy actually out in space before you guys can pull that off, months before you can pull that off. And they had no, the reason the Americans could do that is because their Gemini capsule was pressurized and could be depressurized. You could do that because they had all those, their equipment was, their electronics were transistorized. Transistors don't care if it's air pressurized or unpressurized. The Soviets were still flying equipment. The electronic equipment had vacuum tubes in it. It was like an old radio. such an amazing detail. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it extraordinary? 
uh, in, until like 1980, I think, finally, when they finally transistorized their onboard electronics. You cannot depressurize and repressurize that capsule. So they had to come up with one of their usual contraptions to work around a situation that they had created for themselves uh, to beat the Americans. So it was it was the old BB um, capsule, the old Vostok capsule was called. They figured out how to stick like a rubber tube onto the uh, onto the hatch. The idea was is that um, you would open the hatch. The rubber tube had a uh, um, it had a hatch of its own, so the pressure was still happening inside inside the the capsule. One of the cosmonauts would climb up into this tube and it would expand as he climbed up into it. Then he would close the hatch behind him. He would open the other hatch and he would float out into space. Um, it sort of worked. He, the, the Leonov got out that way. It's amazing that you, you could even do that. Um, but his spacesuit, which was also, they had no spacesuits for EVAs at, at the time they decided they were going to do this within a couple of months. So they jerry-rigged his spacesuit. It blew up like the Michelin Man when he was out there. His fingers retracted so far that they were out of the gloves. His feet were nowhere near the boots. And he's supposed to manipulate himself back into this tube and climb down this tube back into the BB, the giant BB. Um, uh, There was a point at which... His his daughter was watching on TV, and she was like, tell Daddy to get back in. So what is he nuts? And his father was watching, too. He said, tell him to stop acting like that. Get back in there. What are you, crazy? And, and I, I say in the book, they were they had a lot more sense than anybody in the, in the Soviet space program. <laughs> yes. Uh, he shouldn't have been out there. They were right. Uh, he There's a point where he decided he couldn't fit in feet first the way he was supposed to. So he tries to wriggle in head first. And he only gets in about halfway. So you have this this image. I, I have this image in my mind of this Soviet spacecraft orbiting the Earth with a guy's legs dangling outside of it because he can't get back in. It's just terrible. He yeah. finally he depressurized his spacesuit, which was a very dangerous thing to do. Very. It, you could get like the bends that, that divers get when they come up from deep water um but he did not he got back in um then they had to fire these bolts to eject that stupid tube that they had had to stick on and firing the bolts completely disrupted the the flight pattern of that bb that they were in and they tumbled back to earth and darn near died doing that so that's the first but they hid all of that of course they they, those they were interviewed on american tv and didn't say one about it because they were good you know they knew what they were supposed to be doing and so uh, everybody was just astonished that the soviets had beaten us to yet another spacewalk yeah. the one thing they did do was that it goaded the americans into actually having the guy actually step outside instead of just sticking his head and shoulders up so in a way they they prodded the americans to be a little more wrong stuff about the, what they were doing Right. And that's Ed White, right? Who does the first American EVA. And he has the little gas gun with him so he can move around. So they one up those Soviets that way. But the, uh, later astronauts had terrible trouble with those spacesuits. It took a while to figure out you're going from inside the capsule to outer space. It took a while for them to figure out the how to do the suits. Yeah. So some of the others came quite close to dying as well. Some Americans, I'm saying. It wasn't always just the Soviets. It just the Soviets seemed to have like a genius for messing up and then sometimes surviving and sometimes not. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned Leonov, who who becomes this another towering figure in, in the cosmonaut yeah. kind of um, pantheon and, and, and someone who speaks, you know, about the experience and he is kind of pointed to. And it's so fascinating to me how so many of these people, I mean, it's Gagarin, Titov, Leonov, they, they, they kind of understood like your role is not just to go up. Your role is to tell everybody how perfect it was and how superior the yeah. technology was. But there are cosmonauts later who do, when after the Soviet Union has fallen, kind of start to reveal things about how it went, aren't there? But, and um, Leonov is one of them in a way. He begin, he becomes a little more um, candid about how things were in, after, in the 1990s. Right. And when he did that book, and I don't remember when it came out, but I think it was late 90s. Um, 
by then he could say more, everybody could say more than they were able to say back at the time. So, um, and they were, they complained internally when thing when they found things to be intolerable, but usually it was just intolerable in a way that a, a fighter pilot would think things were intolerable. Like we're not getting enough flight time. We're, we're not getting enough credit for our, our great, you know, they weren't doing a great job of saying, all right, you know, I think well, the hatch really needs to be in a different position. And we, they, they let the technology, left the technology up to the engineers. Yeah. And another point that you make in the, in the book too, which I was news to me, uh, you know, the American early, the astronauts were also, you know, fighter jocks and, and, yeah. and, and took some pride in the fact that they were to some degree piloting or had control internally yeah. over their own capsules. The Soviets were piloting it largely from the ground and these cosmonauts were kind of just strapped in and letting somebody else do the steering, which I found so fascinating that that's very counter to the way that the Americans did things. The, the, the reason the astronauts had any control, though, over there were a couple of reasons. Um, those space capsules, because they were sort of conical shaped, they, they needed some pitching and yawing and, and, and controlling to get back to Earth and to, to survive the, um, the reentry process. And that, the technology wasn't great. The computer technology wasn't great for doing that from the ground. So you needed the astronauts to be doing some piloting of their own. But it was still very minimal and rudimentary. Um, the Soviet guys, no, they, uh, Gagarin's flight, he could, it was like he could turn the volume up on the radio. And so <laughs> he could do very, very, very little on his own. Um, and, and that stayed in place for quite a while. They really always liked to be controlling it from the ground. They just felt better about it. You follow the the history through <clears throat> these early, you know, single person launches and the two mans yeah. and the three mans stuffing three into one, as yeah. it were. Um, and you know, and this and the Soviets really, you know, keep ahead and keep the pace. It seems uh, against the Americans, and then the fortunes start to shift when it comes to the moon race. Yeah. Um, talk about where it is that the Soviets in the, in the quest to get a man on the moon really start to to fall behind the Americans. Yeah, it, it, they in, in some ways they were half-hearted about it from the beginning um, because there was so much military influence on the Soviet space program. The military couldn't have cared less about putting a man on the moon. It's, it had no strategic purpose that they could see. What they wanted was space stations where they could be spying on the Americans and and, and, and dropping bombs on the Americans if they had to. Um, so they, they never pursued it the way the, the Americans did once. Kennedy said, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. And it became the purpose of NASA. M meanwhile, in the United States, the, the, the dark military, dark space military programs were pursuing exactly the same things that the Soviet military were, but we didn't hear about any of that. We just heard about NASA and the moon program. Uh, and, and because Kennedy had put his marker down on it, then that's what we were going to do. So that was part of the reason. Another part of the reason they never quite got themselves together on it is that whereas the, the Americans put all their efforts into a single quasi-civilian NASA program, in the Soviet Union, it was a chaos of different engineers and different politicians um, a lot of how you got to build a space rocket was because this politician or that politician liked you and wanted to put his name on your rocket. So there were competing moon programs. There were three competing moon programs yeah. in the Soviet Union in a nation where it was already strapped for resources, going broke. Um, it just wasn't going to work. Their, their ideas, their dominant ideas for getting there were correspondingly not very good. Uh, the, the, the one that was, had the best shot of happening had uh, three guys going up. One guy would then go EVA and get into a little lander, like, kind of like the lunar lander that we used. He would go down by himself because they couldn't figure out how to get two guys into this thing. Uh, he would go down, he would land on the moon. God forbid he should fall over on the moon because in his Michelin man spacesuit, he probably wouldn't get up again. Um, 
But if he didn't, then he would fly back to the the other capsule, reattach, re-EVA over into the other capsule, and then the three of them would come home. It was a re- it was just fraught with so many possibilities of disaster, and uh, it never got very far along. And while they were messing around with those ideas, the Americans shot ahead. Finally, the the tortoise overtook the hare and uh, made it to the moon. They the Soviets had sent a lunar probe um, a couple of days before the Apollo Eleven guys took off. It, the Apollo Eleven guys actually saw this lunar probe going overhead as they were standing on the surface of the moon, and uh, it went around to the other side of the moon and crashed. <laughs> and that. <laughs> and that's when the, the the moon program for the Soviets was over. Right, was, right. Was it. You know, it, it's it, in reading the book and hearing you recount these stories. I mean, it's it's it, it, they, they're just all of these points were just everything could have gone wrong. And I mean, I'm reading the book and I'm like catching my breath sometimes as I'm <laughs> reading these things. I mean, imagine researching this. You must have just I mean, were there points where you were like, you know, I thought I'd seen everything, and then I found out they did something even crazier. <laughs> constantly, constantly. Every day I'd be like, oh, my God, they did what? <laughs> Wait, he couldn't find an antenna to stick on this thing, so he took his tape tape measure and un, unspooled his tape measure and called that an antenna? Really? Come on. Yeah. But it just, it, every day I was reading something new. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, towards the end of the book, I mean, there, there is there are there are so many herring missions, and, and a lot of people, you know, die, including on the launch pad. But yeah. um, what the one that I found is especially just so sad. It was uh, the Soyuz Eleven mission. Yeah. I think. Can you tell that story? And there's a, there's a part in there where you ask the reader to reread a particular <laughs> sentence because it kind of says this is the Soviet space program in a single sentence. It, it's just extraordinary that um, this is um, when they had their, their, the Salyut space station up there, which was a nightmare for them. Three guys stuck into this little, like, it was like an iron pipe in space. that They were stuck in living on top of one another for days and day, weeks and weeks on end. Um, these three guys in particularly got on one another's nerves. They bickered with one another. They fought. They fought with ground control the whole time. Ground control finally said, bring them down. Just get them back down here. So, uh, oh, there was a there was a, a fire at one point on board. I mean, they, it, it was just a, a horrific experience for all three of these guys. Um, they get back into the capsule. It won't. The seal won't work. The capsule is not sealed, and it won't work. And it won't. And they're at this point, they're getting pretty frantic. Ground control says, "Do this," and that doesn't work. Say, "Okay, flip the switch." That doesn't work. They finally, ground control finally says to them, "Tape a piece of paper over that warning light." and proceed on your journey home. And that's the line they say, read that line again. That says everything you need to know about how the Soviet Union ran its space program. Tape a piece of paper over it and come on, come on back. So they do, because they're desperate to get away from Salyut. They, on their return voyage, they lose uh, communications with them. It lands the way it's supposed to land. They open it up and they die because all the oxygen because there was no seal, uh, had left them. And they were still wearing the leisure suits at this point in the program. They were not wearing the spacesuits. Had they been wearing spacesuits, they would have survived. Yeah, right. Had, had they had the spacesuits on when this depressurized you know, yeah. uh, capsule there, and they would have survived it. And as you write, I mean, they died a quick but agonizing death. I mean, this is a Good. horrific... It's- your Wait. blood boils and all sorts of horrible things. Yeah, happen. it's like the void of space. And, and I, I read that and it was such a poignant story because I thought, you know, when the ground controller is telling them just put a paper over the light, they must have known there was at that point a very good chance these guys are just going to die. Oh, yeah. I, I, there, there's a, a, a for one of the other ones. Um, he's having trouble getting back down. The ground control uh, is frantic. They're trying to come up with things to do. Finally, one of the military men in the control room takes his hat off, throws a couple of rubles in it, and starts passing it around to everybody else in the room to collect coins for the family because they know this guy is not coming back. And he didn't. He died in the capsule. Yeah, it, it is the it is the complete opposite of 
uh, you know, the, probably one of the most famous space missions Americans know, which is Apollo 13, you know, of yeah. course, the movie starring Tom Hanks, where, you know, these there's an accident on the way to the moon and the engineers and the guys in the capsule are doing everything they can moving heaven and earth to figure out how to fix it so they can bring them back alive. And here with Soyuz 11, it's like, well, they tried some things and they kind of think, eh, shit, I guess that's not going to work. Oh, well, you know, das Vidanya, good luck. Just don't look at the light. <laughs> that means you're about to die. Unbelievable. That, that line more than anything, that moment more than anything, yeah. I think sums up the program. Yeah. Yeah. There's also, you have this startling statistic near the end that gets at the legacy of these cosmodromes. I mean, these for the people who were you know, living near them. And you, oh, write, yeah. Yeah, and you write that according to studies in the 1990s, nine of 10 people who were living in certain downrange areas from these yeah. facilities displayed heightened rates of pathologies ranging from liver damage to rickets. And the yeah. overall death rates were as much as 30% higher than average. And it, it just, it struck me that the Soviet space program's lack of concern for the safety and well-being of its cosmonauts extended to people on the ground. And I, I just found that to be uh, just appalling. I think you can expand that. In my, if I can be a little political for a minute, I think the Soviet Union's lack of uh, care for Soviet citizens is manifest in so many ways through the, the entire length of time, the 70 years or whatever it was, that the Soviet Union existed. They, it was a, more of a nightmare for people living in the Soviet Union than it was for Afghans when they, you know, when they attacked Afghan or anywhere else. They were terrible to their own people. Um, the way they uh, built their nuclear plants is a direct corollary to the way they ran their, uh, their cosmodromes. They just didn't care that people nearby... And, and, to the extent that they did care, it was because they, they were using them as lab rats and studying the effects of, in the case of the rockets, it was the effects of this horribly poisonous rocket fuel that they were using. And with the, the nuclear things, it was, you know, if we pour a bunch of nuclear waste into this river and the locals keep fishing in this river, uh, are they going to grow two heads? Let's see. And they would study them. It was just awful. And I'm yeah. not so sure the Russian Federation, Putin's Russian Federation, is a lot more... Uh, sympathetic to his own people, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, and there is sort of a, um, uh, 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 we'll maybe get to a final anecdote about Putin and the, the <laughs> legacy of the space program, which touches right. on the invasion of Ukraine. But yeah. talk a little bit about um, just what happens to the space program after the Soviet Union collapses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the first thing that happens is that there's no money anymore. The Russian Federation was baroque. Uh, at the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union had been going broke and going broke and going broke, and now it doesn't exist, and it's just the Russian Federation, and uh, it's broke. So it has real trouble keeping up anything like um, a space program, for God's sake. Um, their facilities get incredibly dilapidated. They already weren't great, but now they're really falling apart. To, um, to earn any cash for it, to help run it, they're starting to um, uh, collaborate with uh, Americans and uh, they're having astronauts, British astronauts, French, whoever they can get, who pay a tremendous amount of money to go up into the, the horrible mirror, the space station mirror, which was another horror. Um, and, and everything becomes even more rattle trap and, and, and glued together than it had been in the Soviet Union. As strapped for cash as the Soviet Union was, the Russian Federation was dirt poor, and it took a, to this day. There are some people see effects in the Russian space program of of them piecing things together and trying to make things work with very small budgets. Nothing like Americans or certainly the corporate people now uh, uh, have to play with. Nothing like that amount of money to play with. Yeah, so yeah. it falls apart and it becomes really dangerous. And, and guys, there's an excellent book by an American astronaut who went up to Mir as part of one of these exchange programs and was just appalled by how by how ramshackle it was, how it almost killed him and the, and the, and the, and the, the cosmonauts aboard. And the cosmonauts aboard kind of had more of the old space cowboy attitude. They were like, well, what would you expect? You know, It's Russia. <laughs> it's Russia. We survived, don't we? Have another vodka. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I alluded to uh, the, uh, the the Putin connection. That's at the very end of the book. There's yeah. uh, in, in the invasion of Ukraine. There is a uh, a famous airplane. Uh, uh, what t- t- tell tell the story for people because some people will have seen pictures from the Russian invasion. They will know they will have seen this airplane, but might not know yeah. its history. Yeah. It, it's such a it, it's uh, it's such an amazing legacy of the space program. Uh, toward the end of the Soviet Union. When we had the space shuttle going, they decided they had to have a space shuttle of their own. Um, and they copied it down almost to the last rivet, except the Soviets were always working with much heavier metals. than They didn't have the alloys, the lightweight, strong alloys we had to make things out of. So their space shuttle, their fake space shuttle, which was called the Buran, um, weighed just tons and tons. It was, it was, it was a space anvil that they had to hurl up into, into space. So they had to build a giant rocket to get it up into space in the first place. But then they also had to build a giant airplane to cart the thing from where it was being built, which was in outside of Kiev in, in uh, Ukraine, uh, to Kazakhstan, to the Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. So they built what was then, and it might even still be, but it was certainly then the biggest airplane ever built uh, it was it was so long that the Wright brothers could have done their first flight inside it. They could have flown from one end of the thing to the other. It's enormous. Um, they fly the Buran to Kazakhstan. They fly the jet plane, the giant jet plane, back to the airport outside of Kiev. Um, it sits there for a while. It gets a little use. At, then the Soviet Union falls apart, like in the next year. So uh, it sits. It gets a little use during... Um, the COVID, uh, the pandemic, because they're flying, they're using it to fly tremendous amounts of uh, uh, vaccines around the world because they did all the vaccines anybody could create in this thing. It's so big that it doesn't fit in any hangar. They can only, they can pull it up into the hangar, but then the giant tail is always sticking outside of the hangar. Uh, and uh, on like the second day, and but it's a huge symbol for Ukrainians. Um, Ukrainians, uh, you know, now they're independent. They had always wanted to be independent from the Russians anyway. And finally, they're independent with the with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's their pride, this uh, this Andropov air, airplane. Second day, maybe third day, I think second day of the invasion. The And certainly on the directions of Putin, I'm absolutely sure this was his idea. Some of the rockets that were fired in the Kiev that day were fired on top of that plane and just destroyed it and it's hang. And to me, that's, that's, there you go. That's the legacy. Yeah. I, I'm curious that after you've spent all of this time researching this, you know, incredible period of, of human space flight and, and all of the, the risks and the, the horrors and the tragedies and, and the, and the triumphs too, yeah. that went along with it for the Soviets and the Americans. Yeah. Do you, do you come away thinking that the, that the human space program was a worthwhile endeavor? Or does it get kind of chalked up to this was all so much bluster and competition and really why the hell are we spending this kind of money on this? It, it, it's a real, I, I am of two minds about it. It's a great question. Um, on the one hand, I'm a space nerd from day one. Uh, I, if, some, if they said to me, if the Soviets came to me today and said, you want to go up in one? I'd say, oh yeah. I'll go. Let's go. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and uh, yeah, let's do it. Like that thing. Um, on the other hand, uh, an awful lot of it was and still is for PR value, for propaganda value. Its scientific value is limited. Um, what we learn in terms of uh, Velcro and other gadgets that come out of the program certainly don't add up to all the money and human endeavor and human misery and deaths involved in it. So I don't know. I mean, no, I don't think so. I think it's probably we should be probing, continuing to probe with unmanned probes, and they do a lot more work. And I mean, look, look at the 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 what's been going on with the telescopes and that, and completely, completely altered our understanding of the universe. And no man flight was ever going right. to do that. Uh, on the other hand, if they asked me today, I'd go. Right. Yeah. Mm. I, I think I come down at the same way you do. I find I, I find 
you know, the, the, the stories of, you know, human daring, you know, thrilling. And yes, I mean, a lot of it is PR and we've been told a certain story. And as your book, you know, very wonderfully (laughs) illuminates, a lot of it is not all pretty. Um, But, you know, at the same time, if somebody came to me and said, you want to go on this thing, I'd say, sure. In in fact, I mean, it's, I, I, I had this, you know, the the guy who owns the newspaper I work for, Jeff Bezos, has a, a, a side hustle launching rockets. And, uh, you know, in, in watching the sort of the thrill that people have had with the idea of That's putting right. people into space, and these people are barely going into space. I mean, by well, all, technically, they're not. They're right. technically it's not, as you point out in the book. Yeah. Where you say it begins. If space begins at 100 kilometers, they're not going in space. Yeah, right. Uh, I had this though, this moment of when, when Bezos launched himself on the first Blue Origin rocket. Yeah. I was like, a little bit, you know, a little bit of a heart palpitation. I'm like, please, let's not like, you know, kill the owner of the paper. But I joked to my colleagues. I said, when he then flew with William Shatner, I said to them, okay, here's the deal, Jeff. If you mm-hmm. die on your own rocket, we'll find a way to carry on. If you kill yeah. Captain Kirk, we're finished. <laughs> But if you're Kirk, you're going to say yes. He, of I, course, I, he said yes. Yeah. He was tickled pink to oh be alone. Oh, my God. Yeah. And there's a yeah. wonderful, and, and you mentioned this in the book, too. There's a wonderful thing that happened on the Blue Origin rocket, which is where they took um, one of the women from the so called Mercury 13, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. who were women who were recruited in. Uh, to the space program, largely, I think it's probably a PR gimmick, but and who oh, never had oh. the chance to fly. Uh, no, they, the United States didn't put a, a woman into space until Sally Ride in the 80s. But one of these women in her 90s, right, got to fly on a Blue Origin rocket. Yeah. She, I think she's the same as your Shatner, if, I, if I'm yeah. correct. Yeah. Like in a year or two of, of, of William Shatner, who's in his early 90s. Right. Um, and and it, to me, it's a little sad because... Even then, those Mercury 13 women, none of them had gone into space because that thing went up 76 kilometers and technically outer space is 100 kilometers. So she didn't go into space. And the Americans, until Sally Ride, they never intended to put women in space. They were more or at least as troglodytic about the idea of women in space as the Soviets were. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Even though, even though those Mercury Thirteen uh, members were were terrific pilots uh, and, and were perfectly qualified, the same, they couldn't fly jets. No women were allowed to even fly a jet plane. They could only fly prop planes. We're talking yeah. the nineteen sixties. Couldn't fly jets. Yeah, no. It, it's, 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 can women fly combat? I don't think so. Can they? Right. Are women? I, I don't know. I think there are there are women fighter pilots. I I. I confess I don't know if they're allowed to fly combat runs. Yeah, I think they're still not, but I could be wrong. About yeah. I know a few years ago they were because yeah. I, I read one complaint about it. Well, it, it is ultimately, I've, I've always thought of the space program, whether it's the Russian or the American one, is, is a, is a, it is a great human drama, I mean, with operatic right. kind of themes. And your yeah. book, I mean, captures all of that as well. I mean, it is just, it, it's, it, it's, it's an illuminating part of history. But I think what it really gets to is, this just incredible drive that overtook people in that time to do something that seemed impossible. Yeah. And, and did it. And, and on that level, you gotta, in some ways you no, I think even in a lot of ways, you have to admire what those, so not the Soviet leaders, but the Soviet scientists and engineers and cosmonauts, what they pulled off, Maybe a little more than what the astronauts pulled off because they had it much rougher, much harder to pull anything off. And they did. And they did it over and over again. So you got to give them credit, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think so too. Um, well, our tradition here on Chatters, the last question that I ask you comes from the Chatter Box, which contains a <laughs> series of pre written questions. And I'm going to draw one at random. And that'll be the last question that we have okay. here uh, on the show. Okay, so let's see. Oh. Now this is this is the perfect question for you. This is a pre-written question, remember. Should the United States send a manned mission to Mars? Oh. My same answer. Uh, no, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If we it's like building colonies on the moon because we we're screwing up the earth so bad that we have to have an escape valve and somewhere else to go to to start screwing up. Um, we should fix things here before we go to the moon or Mars. Then again, if the phone rings five minutes from now and they say, you want to go? I'm, I'm, I'm there. Me I'm too. going. Me too. I would love to go to Mars. Can you imagine? Oh. So, well, I know. But I think that's the impulse. It's kind of, and I think that drove a lot of the people, has driven a lot of the people who actually do it. It's just that impulse of like, oh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Sure. Yeah, sign me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you read about the originators of the space program, all the original scientists and engineers, they all they were reading Jules Verne and 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 uh, H. G. Wells, and and as boys, and they were all boys at that time, reading science fiction, and and so the urge was, oh yeah, I'd do that. Yeah, and I think that's still true. Totally, I was one of those kids that went to space camp twice, uh, oh. and my. You know, my dream was to either be an astronaut or a writer. Uh, so I, I, I took, I got the second route, which was great. But I'm with you, John. If they came to me today and said, you know, like, hey, we need a, you know, you need a journalist to go along or a writer in space. I said, yeah, where do I sign? Like, let's go today. Absolutely. So, let's go. Totally. Well, maybe they will. Let's hope they do. I hope so. I hope so. If anyone's listening from NASA, call me. Uh, uh, John Strasbaugh, the book is The Wrong Stuff, How the Soviet Space Program Crashed and Burned. Um, I just loved reading it, and I so enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for coming on the show to talk about it. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.